Live? Oh, it's live now. Oh. That's your cue, Seth. <laughs> you're, you're supposed to be the yes, first one to talk. Welcome to Scala Wags, the, the podcast about Scala. Um, it's episode 21, and I'm Seth, and that's Josh and Dick, and that's Daniel and his cat. His unfeasibly the, large cat. This, uh, the, the, I cannot well, believe the size of his cat. There's, there's a lot of forced perspective happening here. <laughs> also, he says he wants more food. Somebody send somebody send uh, rescue. Daniel is being attacked by an enormous cat. Yeah. We have wow. an action-packed agenda for you tonight, our listeners. Oh, God, Seth's good great, at this, that man. Great yeah, that was great issue, man. I, I know. You, I, your, your announcer voice beats all of our announcer voices. <laughs> I can I can feel the jaws of evolution closing around my neck as Seth just <laughs> like, takes it away, man. I used to do college radio. Oh wow, <laughs> you're you're actually qualified for this. Holy cow! Yeah. So the goal here? was to have the cat do the intro, but you know. Yeah. <laughs> he he doesn't failed. speak a lot except to whine about sustenance. Uh, sustenance <laughs> meaning like pet me. I went on the show, that sort of thing. No, yeah. more like sustenance being I just finished off my bowl of food and it's empty now. It needs more things in it. Uh, okay. Well, since the people want to hear more about the cat, we should yeah. not talk about it. Exactly. Um, the, there's plenty of websites for looking at cat videos and cat pictures. We we are not one of those podcasts. <laughs> I just, I, I just want to... Did you impressed. think the cat the strange loop? I didn't. Um, I thought about it, yeah. but uh, no, it, I don't think he would have had a good time in my hotel room. I had a good time, though, not in my hotel room. I don't know if he room. would fit on a plane. He, he looks enormous. Yeah. He does. I should, I should make him, like, go behind me, and then he'll look tiny. He's actually a very, very small cat. I, I just oh. want to point out one of the great injustices of the universe here, which is cats have hair grown out of their ears in kind of tufts, and it looks awesome. If I get that, Jackie <laughs> says I have to get rid of the hair coming out of my ear. <laughs> so it's just not fair, is it? Yeah. 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 Well, welcome everyone. This is Scalawags. And the big news of the day is <laughs> Seth was in college radio. Uh, and... I need to refresh. I need to refresh. <laughs> and the big news is Scalawags has... Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, this is like the first year they've announced them the dates the year before, isn't it? Uh, oh, is it? Maybe. I don't know. It's still so. So hold on. To be fair, to be fair, that since there's two of them, the first one is in March, so it's about the same amount of leeway you had for the last couple of days. It just happens to be in the year before because it's in March. Uh, yeah. This is true. Well, I am pumped. But I, I want this yeah. to be like the first couple of days that I make it to out of the last five years or something. Wow. Which, which so, one? Because there's two of them. There's one in the U.S. and there is one in Europe. Well, it's definitely going to go to the one in San Francisco. March okay. in San Francisco yeah. and June in Amsterdam. 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 Yeah, yeah, man. I want to make it to Amsterdam, but we'll see. Yeah. Love Amsterdam. It's a great city. It is. I've, I've, I've made it as far as Rotterdam before I had to turn around and go home. <laughs> <laughs> you ran out of provision. <laughs> well, no, I was it was in someone else's car. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, um, so that's, I'm, I'm that's actually super excited about that. The, the call for papers is out, so everyone submit awesome papers uh, or call yeah proposals, talk proposals. Submit awesome talk proposals uh, and come plan to be there. Do we have any any? Uh, New info, right? I mean, it's just the dates and the cities is all we know right now. The dates, the cities, and the CFP. Yeah, I think everything else is still... Everything coming. else is left to your imagination, which is the most exciting possible thing. Well, on on blog.typesafe.com, when they talk about the CFP, they say that it's being held at Fort Mason in San Francisco, if you need to know hmm. the venue. And it's held in... I, I'm going to mispronounce it, but it looks like Beers van Berlage in Amsterdam. 
Space? An, an architecturally notable building. That's like it all is. of Amsterdam. It, do a Google image search for it. It's very cool. It's named after beers. That sounds good. <laughs> yeah. If you do a Google image search, I see go to Amsterdam. It and I believe the organizers of Scala Days uh, last year and this year are the same organizers that do the go to conferences. So now I could be wrong, but I'm pretty sure. Fort Mason, I can't remember the name of the place. Fort Mason was where the Scala by the Bay was, I think. It was. Yeah, okay. I, I thought it was, but is then I have... Is it by the yeah. Bay? Is it by the Bay? Or was it that a right, It is right by the Bay. It's like right on the water. You walk down to the end of the building, and there's the water. Okay. It's that much on the Bay. So the pictures I saw of Fort Mason actually look gorgeous. It is a really nice. It was a really nice venue, actually. And there's this big, foodie truck thing that happens there with uh, off the grid. I think it's called, with all the uh, the food trucks, the gourmet food trucks that get together in this one place. Hmm. So uh, you don't go hungry. I I'm a big fan of food trucks. If I if I could own a food truck and cook in that instead of my kitchen, I probably would. <laughs> there's some really really good ones in San Francisco. Yeah, um, I'm uh, like my office is in Soma, and I'm I'm very very fond of this like spot underneath the expressway where you can't actually hear anything, but they put like astroturf down, and they have a rotating set of food trucks, and they're all really good. So what this means is at Scala Days, you will have an endless supply of food truck food, as it should while be you, while you're at the conference. Yeah. Will you bring That'd Will you good. bring your food truck kitchen, Josh? <laughs> I I don't have one yet. Oh, That's, <laughs> I need to. I need to. I need to like level up to having the food truck status. <laughs> he has to have an SBT plugin for it before he can do it. Uh, I have to, wait, it's it's it, the rule is once you write three books, you're allowed to get a food truck. That's, <laughs> so. I didn't even realize those things were related. <laughs> and in Amsterdam, we'll have an endless supply of of what of. Um, <laughs> You even need to ask. So, so of, of mayonnaise, mayonnaise so, and and hair. Bitter almond, man. Bitter no, almond. no, no. It's the, it's all about the cafes, man, and they don't serve coffee. Well, remember they changed it. Um, you're <laughs> like, you, it's not actually legal unless you're a citizen. Right. You need you need you need paperwork now. I think. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, because I they see. had too many people who were coming there, like specifically for that. Yeah. Now, now that. it's all like if you want that Boulder. I was gonna say, yeah. Yeah. So, so just stay home. Basically, everyone who would like to have a marijuana-based Scala conference should go to the Scala Summit. Indeed, everyone. they should. Indeed, they should. Everyone. <laughs> <laughs> Josh, that was an incredible segue. Well, well it done. Was, it was wow. excellently performed. <laughs> Scala Summit just happened. Do you want to give us a, a report of what that, what it was like, how how things went? Anything interesting? Yeah, sure. Oh, it was all good. Uh, God, I love that one. I mean, it's it's such a it's such a great uh, excuse, basically, to goof off for a week, uh, go hiking and mountain biking, do tons of Scala, and just like hack around with people who are interested in Scala for a week. Uh, it's it's so free form that you can pretty much do whatever the hell you like. We built a. Uh, I think the highlight for me was because James James Ward was there as well. Uh, we ended up. Uh, spending a day hacking up a... The idea originally was to come up with like a full weather station. The That that scope was rather big for just, you know, eight hours of hacking or whatever. But we came up with a pretty convincing wind station where, you know, we uh, we got this thing called a, a PC Duino. I don't know if you've heard of this. Uh, think, think Raspberry Pi and Arduino kind of uh, munged together into a single board. So it's got all of the Arduino interfaces, uh, but it's got enough like power to actually run uh, Scala on there, which we did. We ran Scala and Play, and we had SBT running the whole the whole nine yards. And we had wow. this thing we had this thing hooked up to a breadboard with uh, a little motor that we uh, you know it was in one of the kits. We got the motor. We like taped a straw to the motor and then taped a pinwheel to the straw. So you could blow on the pinwheel and it would turn at a different speed and generate a voltage and then you'd see this thing like in a real-time graph that was served up on a play uh, from a play app. It was pretty cool, actually. 
That's that's awesome. And I mean, we would you, you had me at SBT. But. <laughs> <laughs> we uh, we were trying to get the rest of the weather station together based on this little. I mean, this is the thing. the The Internet of Things is like, uh, you know, whatever you want to call it. Just this excuse to mess around with really fun gadgets. Uh, it's very captivating, and we got a, a thing called a sensor tag as well. And we were trying to get that working, and the problem with that was it used Bluetooth low energy, and I didn't have a, uh, you know, a little nubbin that would uh, do Bluetooth 4. So we couldn't get that working in the end, but I think if we could have got that going, we, we could have got, uh, you know, temperature and light, and uh, they, they have... Uh, atmospheric pressure and all sorts of stuff on there in those little sensor tags. And they're 25 bucks. It's amazing what you can get these days. Yeah. So uh, I saw something which I thought was hilarious where people use the Internet of Things in a very terrible way. They actually set up an aquarium and a, a, a camera sensor that would detect where the, a fish was swimming in a little aquarium. And wherever the fish swam, that was a button it would press in the game of Pokemon. And you can watch oh, no. the fish and Pokemon. It was called Fish Plays Pokemon. <laughs> the, the the Internet of Fish. The Internet of Fish, I think, is what, what I'd love. Yeah. Those, I mean, I agree with you. The Internet of Things is awesome. Making a sensor tower sounds too useful, in my opinion, for a true Internet of Things. Yeah, I, I agree. I think we, we, too we, useful. Were, we were far too... Uh, we were not nearly abstract enough. Yeah. I, I remember the stories where, uh, of course, as far as I know, they were complete ho hocus pocus, uh, you know, a, a complete BS of the, um, but you must have heard these when you were working at Google, of the random numbers based on lava lamps and cameras that they supposedly had. Yeah, do you remember those ones? And there's the, like this yeah. room there with lava lamps and cameras and they're generating random numbers. Yeah. As far as I know, that was always just one of those little rumors. But, but, um, but that's that's fun. Well, anyway, yeah. hacking hacking on things, hiking, it's that's that's awesome. It was it was really good. And yeah, the 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 talks were good. I mean, it was it was a great thing. We we should uh Josh, we try and get you out there next year, man, cuz we missed you. We missed you and yeah. we missed Mark. I particularly yeah. missed you guys on the long drive back to Denver. <laughs> oh yeah, that was really fun. We yeah. we stopped we stopped at the divide and uh yeah, I think I need to work out so I can make it to the top of that little <laughs> bridge. I, I did this time. I, I actually walked up there and took a bunch of photos on the way through. I had time. It was really good. Where, where did you go over the divide? Uh, Cottonwood Pass, which is... Oh, uh, south of Lovelace. Yeah, only yeah. open in the summer. Man, it is thin air up there. It's like 12,000 feet or something, 12,500 feet. It's, it can be brutal. Yeah. Uh, it's really brutal. Yeah. So, Dick, this sensor app, did you guys also build a version of it in Kotlin by any chance? We did not, but there was actually, that was an interesting thing at the conference. Now we're getting all serious about the uh, the conference, the summit. Yeah. Uh, Co Kotlin was a big interest. Uh, there was a couple of hackathons, huh. uh, afternoon hackathons, looking into Kotlin. And uh, it got pretty favorable reviews from people, for the most part. Uh, there was also a little bit of interest in Swift. Although I think that, and I think we've got something about Swift later. The general feeling is, until Apple, you know, commits to opening it up to other platforms than just Apple, most people are sort of staying away from it. They're not, they're not willing to sign on to something that has that that limited of a purview. Hmm. But uh, yeah, the Kotlin Kotlin stuff looks pretty good. Uh, there was lots of talk about Haskell, of course. A little bit of Idris. Uh, it was good. Yeah. Yeah. It was nice. It was a really fun week. My batteries got well and truly recharged for for coding. So awesome. Those those are the best when you actually like come back more refreshed. Yeah. Versus when you go and you come back more stressed out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I, I I love Strange Loop, but you know when I came back, it was just like even even actually just the day after like the the night of Strange Loop, I was just like I was completely completely mentally exhausted. It, there's very few conferences that will wipe me out quite like that one does, but it's just like it's one of those where it's just like everything has shut down and I'm just going to sleep for like 12 hours because it needs time to process. So uh, I, uh, I think I Dana, you and Seth were both at Strange Loop, right? Yep. Yes. 
Yeah, so, that's a good segue right there. I think. Yeah, let's. What? 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 Highlight. Highlight reel. You know, what's the? What was the best thing you saw in Strange Loop that people should check out? What was the worst thing you saw? Except <laughs> don't, don't actually go into that. That's not really um, the best thing. Yeah. I don't know. I I had a lot of fun with the closing keynote. Um, but I mean, I, I, the so the closing keynote was um, the uh, the guys from Overtone, which is a, a closure project for programmatically making music, and um, also Karen. I can't remember her last name. Sorry, Karen. Um, uh, Meyer. Who, Karen Meyer. Thank you. Um, who uh, programs robots uh, from closure with closure? Um, so like all sorts of robots. She had a Parrot uh, VR and she had um, uh, she had a, what's the one that's a vacuum cleaner? Um, oh, the uh, oh, God. Roomba. Roomba, yeah. Yeah, she had a Roomba and she had like this ball thing. Anyway, um, so basically what they did is they had the the, 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 the grand finale of the entire conference was um, the Overtone guys were who, who actually have like a band now. Um, they were improvising music and they fed her a network feed that gave the beats that they were doing, and then she fed that into her programmatic dance routines, and then she improvised dance routines for the robots who were actually dancing in time to the music. Ah. I don't, I don't think you even mentioned that one of the robots was flying. Oh yeah, the the parrot was flying. Wow, a flying robot. She, she had to. She it, it was a yeah, it was a parrot drone. She had to actually like take a leash and tie it down to a water bottle because it kept escaping. Ah, <laughs> there, there was a dedicated person for catching robots that fell off stage. It was it was awesome. <laughs> it, it like it did not go perfectly, but it was amazing. I like, like the idea reverse, that uh, reverse bouncer. Yeah. I like the idea that people have now been enslaved to look after the robots on stage. That's the dancing, that is, that is our, the that is our entertainment future. bots. Yeah, that exactly. is our future yeah. right there. We're we're going to be standing around waiting to catch the robots. <laughs> and they will be our lords and masters. Uh, yep, yeah. I, I embrace this future. The Internet of Things. <laughs> you heard it here first. <laughs> but yeah, um, I also I loved the. Uh, I also really loved the Nashorn talk. That this was actually like at the very beginning of the the conference, but there was a really 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 good co- uh, talk on how Nashorn is optimized and like the various tricks that they play to try to make numerics fast and then stuff that they do to de-optimize stuff. They have, a, they have an overly optimistic exception um, <laughs> that, that they throw to kind of like unwind the stack and, and rebuild things. It's really, it's very, very clever work. I'm really looking forward to seeing the, the video of that one. I, I can't remember why I, um, why, why I missed it. Did they, uh, I think I saw in the uh, title that the that are in the abstract that they were sort of proposing the, um, the 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 work they were doing as a basis for other dynamic language implementations on the JVM. Yes. So this was this was basically the big the big I, I think they've announced it separately, but I mean this was like the 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 thing that they were really were kind of getting at the meat of the talk was optimizing dynamic languages on the JVM is very hard. Um, it's gotten a lot better since Invoke Dynamic. A lot better since Invoke Dynamic. But it's still very hard, um, and optimizing JavaScript is hard as well. And they have all these like transformations and things like that that they want to do that are too low level to do, perform on the JavaScript AST and far too high level to perform on on bytecode. And so they they kind of it's very awkward. Um, and so even just for them, they're developing an intermediate language uh, which they can compile their AST down to, and it's it's very very close to bytecode. Um, it has some things like named registers. Um, and uh, I think you don't have to resolve dispatch things like that. Um, but there's there's stuff like that, and in this in this IL, so they compi- they they want to compile down to this IL and then compile the IL down to bytecode, and that's going to be very straightforward. But in the middle, they're going to have a lot of optimizations, and that's where they want to put the bulk of their you know optimize your dynamic language here work. And the thing that's cool about it is because they can put the bulk of their work there, they can make it very generally applicable. So people who are writing dynamic languages can target this IL instead. They don't have to worry about resolving their dispatch and swapping out their switch points or anything like that. They don't have to worry about, you know, tracking things like, like he, he gave an example of like a really stupid, stupid thing, right? Where you declare a variable that's like an int um, outside of a try catch block, and then inside that try catch block, you change it to a long, or or like a double, right? 
And then in the catch block, you use this variable. What type is the variable in the catch block? Well, I mean, from like the, the, in order to track that stack slot, like you have to do a lot of really weird juggling on the JVM to make that work, because the, the bytecode validator is going to kick you out if, if all your types don't align. Because um, remember, it, it depends on whether or not you threw an exception if it's a, if it's a you know, int or a double at that point. So um, the IL wants to abstract all of that away so that anyone who's implementing a dynamic language on the JVM can target the NASHORN IL. And they, they had some kitschy name for it, but it is the NASHORN IL. <laughs> and that will, and, and that, the IL will then take care of all of these low-level things that every dynamic language implementer on the JVM has had to suffer through now can be done in one place. If it was, if it was a NASHORN IL8, you could call it Annihilate. <laughs> that would be a pretty cool name. You anyway, should, that, you should propose that, but I, I think they already have a name. <laughs> yeah, and the tagline is annihilate your bytecode. Exactly. <laughs> annihilate. Strap your boilerplate, annihilate your bytecode, be violent. <laughs> yeah. So you were talking about the, the dancing robots. Uh, I, I did have some envy at Strange Loop that, like, the Scala talks were all very serious. Yeah. <laughs> We're just serious um, guys. We're just it's like, oh, I oh, have not. So, we've got an enterprise now. I, you know, I actually, I met, I met someone that not long ago. It was like, oh, you're a programmer. You know, what language do you use? Um, uh, I say, oh, well, you know, usually Scala. And they said, oh, so I guess you're, you're, you know, you must be doing corporate stuff. <laughs> uh, I was like, I mean, I, I couldn't really deny it, right? Yet. Uh, I'm, I'm going to be an Idris developer now. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's true. You, all the demos at uh, DevOx, I think, uh, for Clojure were things like Super Collider, you know, the music, the music thing and stuff like that. And I'm like, wow, we should we should have some stuff like that. We should yeah. we should just come up with some yeah. wacky stuff like my weather station. That's yeah. it. Just Internet of Things and Scala from now on. That's yeah, all I'm going to work on. Uh, I'm sure I, I'll make a ton of money that way. I mean, Dan, Dan Friedman and Will Bird have... I, I've seen them come on stage and demo Scheme, and they'll, they'll demo it through the context of Mini Canron, and they'll, like, build a type checker for the Lambda calculus and, like, generate all possible Lambdas that satisfy a certain type. Or even more fun, like, generate a Quine checker and then generate all possible Quines in the Lambda calculus. Like, they'll, they'll, do, they'll do just insane things. Um, we, we should... We should yeah, I don't know. I feel like... The Scala community needs to do more things that are crazy because they're really fun. Maybe we can hire a clown for Scala days. What do you think? <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to submit that suggestion. Guys, <laughs> we need a clown <laughs> and we need dancing robots. The Scala clown. And, yes. Yeah. So uh, hmm, that's interesting. The, uh, yeah. Yeah. I, I do think we need more just ridiculously stupid projects. I made a, so I gave a talk where we did video streaming of a, like a dancing duck, where you like you take the video and you just like modify the video and stream it around, and it's kind of fun. But the example is a dancing duck. It's an activator template if you want to try it out. Um, yes, you can you can have your own dancing duck streaming thing. But I uh, used to do a lot more stupid projects before I got paid to write Scala. Yeah. Like a I lot more dumb ones. Like I had, I had a plugin that would play the Neancat song when your tests fail, until they succeed. <laughs> so I, I, I will, I, I, I will I, remind I, people and point out we do have Shadaj, and he's yeah. awesome. Uh, he he pretty much fills in all the fun <laughs> that us old geezers that are too boring can't do. So, so why do you think it is that we don't? have as many fun things in the Scala community. Do, well, do it's maybe it's because we're all, we're all actually, uh, maybe the closure people can't get jobs doing closure. So <laughs> their, their talks are about their hobbies, and like, you know we're what? actually getting paid to write Scala, and so our talks are about our, <laughs> our work. You, you laugh, but that is, I think, actually the case. I mean, there, there's closure <laughs> jobs out there. Like, there, there really are. I don't want to downplay the success of a language, because it's definitely gaining traction. But I think, you know, compared to the number of, of you know, Scala jobs out there, it is still a much smaller percentage, unfortunately. So, like, when you talk to a Scala developer, odds are they are actually using it in their day job. And, you know, that's where the bulk of their Scala work is coming in. Because even if you're a really avid, very prolific hobbyist or open source developer, I mean, you're still working eight hours a day. 
at least outside of you know these hobbies. So you probably have a lot more stuff in those eight hours to talk about. Whereas the closureists, like they want to talk about closure because closure is awesome, but the only closure they're doing is like this random thing in their spare time that they're doing because it's awesome and would never make any money. So they're going to talk about that. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's it's yeah. yeah it's an unfortunate metric of language maturity I think. I'm very mm-hmm. jealous. So there's a comment here. It's not, it's from the question app, but it's it's not a question. It's a comment that John Pretty and Miles Seven should be the Scala clowns because they were amazing <laughs> at the last Scala days. They were hilarious. I would call them comedians, not clowns, but it was still it was, it was that was that was pro- probably the best Scala talk I've ever seen. <laughs> I I am so mad general. that I wasn't there. I was so sad. Well, you were there, just when nobody thought you were. <laughs> yeah, I, I was there. Everyone thought I was a recording, though. I actually yeah. get that a lot. People come up to me at conferences and kind of poke me. and Like, are you, are you actually there? Are you, are you a recording? <laughs> I did have a moment where, um, when you were petting your cat a minute ago, I had this strong uh, association of Dr. Evil from uh, Austin Powers. It, with, uh, there was this moment of, oh, my God, Daniel is actually Dr. Evil. It's true. So he, he sits here while I'm coding, and he basically just sleeps and prevents me from having access to my touchpad. <laughs> Excellent. So a few other questions about Strange Loop before, because we should wrap up Strange Loop and talk about our topic. Uh, but uh, yeah, so Seth, anything? Oh my God, the enormous cats back. back. <laughs> Daniel, you grew oh, okay. a giant so, striped so, beard. <laughs> so uh, I, I I saw. Um, Exciting stuff at Strange Loop. I mean, there actually weren't weren't a lot of skull talks. Um, although the, I I did see two that were very good. One by uh, Heather Miller about about spores, and uh, how that's been evolving. And uh, a really good compiler talk by T. R. Romp, um, showing using uh, lightweight modular staging in Scala to compile SQL queries to efficient imperative code. Um, that that was very neat. Um, there were a few Scala talks I missed. Uh, Daniel, were you at the type level Scala, like birds of a feather thing? I was, um, and that that went really, really well. So, one thing I would like to to make extremely clear to anyone who maybe is uncertain about this is that there is no ill will or misfeelings between type level and type safe in any direction. Um, and it, it was really, really clear at this BOF. I think, I think like, the, the room was packed, and I think a lot of people were a little bit concerned at first. It's like, well, I mean, Jamie Allen and, you know, Dean Wampler were there, and, you know, it's like, well, you know, is, is, is TypeSafe kind of, like, keeping an eye on this? Like, well, what do they think? Is this a problem? It's not a problem. The, you know, TypeSafe has been very, very, very supportive, and, and you know, type level has, has been only appreciative of that. So um, the, uh, the BOF basically just went through and answered a whole bunch of questions. Um, we had type level people there, we had type safe people there. And it was a lot of questions of like, well, what are the sorts of things that the type level fork is going to be, you know, attacking? Like what sort of things can it attack? Um, how is it going to be possible to use this in my project and we have to worry about compatibility? What is that going to look like? What sort of constraints are there? Um, and it was really, really, really good. And and there was actually a lot of Fantastic, you know, collaboration and and solving that kind of came out of it because there's, you know, there's there's things that are very very hard about doing work on a compiler, especially doing work on the Scala yeah. compiler, just from an infrastructural standpoint, right? The type level guys have the expertise and they have experience working on Scala C, but like being able to do work and do regression testing and you know actually you know check all these things and actually you know have your own locker and all that stuff, like that's very hard. So. Um, there was a lot of back and forth and talking, talking with things, and uh, you know, there's some stuff in development that I'm really, really excited about um, that that hopefully will come out soon. Um, so I think it was a it was fantastically productive session, um, very good feelings all around, and I think the people who were there, I think, um, feel a lot better about the state of things. Like I think some people were worried about, well, it's forking Scala, and what about the future of Scala? I think everybody feels pretty optimistic about things now. Was that session filmed as well, or, or recorded as well? No, no, that was that's, the that's a were not recorded. Yeah, that's a shame because it would be good to get that out there. I, th- I think I, I, I fully agree. I've, I've been sort of from the type safe side. I've been talking to the type level guys, and, and it all seems to be everybody's very friendly. And, and when I, you know, read 
uh, people's concerns, and they're like, "Oh, this is terrible. The sky's falling." I'm like, "No, this is this is actually, you know, going really well." <laughs> and uh, the the problem is convincing uh, convincing people. Seeing something like that, I think, would actually really help. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, yeah, well, I'm I'm sure that you know. I have no doubt that the the word will eventually get around and people will understand. This is actually a a, a good thing. Uh, one of the things I'm reminded about uh, from this is when Joe, you hear Joe Darcy and uh, Brian Getz and you know the principles behind the the Java C uh, and the the Oracle Java compiler. One of the things they always talk about with feature enhancements is this um, matrix of features. And introducing a new feature into a language, it has to fit in with this matrix of features. And in Java, that's a pretty major major concern. In Scala, that's like, you know, amped up even further. You got so many features in there already. How is it going to work with type inference and uh, you know all those all those kind of things? So that's that's a big part of that uh, kind of uh, rolling forward that development model is how. You know how to deal with that. How to kind of capture those feature matrix uh, that is, problems and things. Yeah, that's that's actually we talked about that a little bit in the session um, because one of the things that type level has committed to do is like if you can compile a Scala source file with Scala C, you can co with no flags. You can compile that same Scala source file with no flags with the type level compiler. Um, that's that's something that that has been a hard commitment. So um, we have to be very careful about that now. One of the features, really, really minor feature, just simple quality of life thing that recently landed in type level was being able to put primes at the end of your identifiers, right? Mm. Haskell's had this forever. It's a fantastically yes, useful thing. Yeah. I will never use the number two in an identifier ever again. Um, so it's, it's great, right? And, you know, this can't possibly conflict with anything because, you know, primes, primes aren't a thing. Like, tick, ticks, ticks aren't, you know, you don't find them at the end of symbols in, in Scala. Well... It landed, and it wasn't it wasn't masked or anything. And then, upon further investigation, it was found that there are actually a couple of cases, some very, very, very weird cases, where because Scala has symbol literals and because Scala has uh, yeah. character literals, you can actually if you can actually do like you know x space foo no space character little literal a, and that parses as call the function foo on x passing, you know a. And of course, if you if you have primes, then that's that's a problem, right? Yeah. Um, so it eventually had to get masked because we couldn't like it, there was just no way to make it not conflict. And so that's that's comes back to what you were talking about, right? Like there's there's just a lot of really really fiddly stuff, and it's really really difficult to make sure it works. And this is yeah. part of why doing very very careful regression testing is, I I if anything, more important for type level than it is for Scala C because we're changing stuff really fundamental stuff. Maybe this is a good we're moment to mention dbuild. Yeah, we, we open source well, started. Actually, b before we finish with Strange Loop, I just okay, want to sure. I, yeah. I insert one more thing, which is a shout out to PureScript. There were two, um, th there was a good talk, someone will have to help me with how you pronounce the name, Bodil Stoker. Bodil Stoker. Um, yeah. She gave a, a great live coding demo of PureScript, and then Phil Freeman, the guy who uh, invented the language, uh, did an on-session on it on Thursday night um, that was really impressive. I've also been playing with the language at, uh, on my own. The book that Phil wrote about the language is great. It's, it, the whole thing seems really promising for people interested in, in doing uh, sort of Haskell-like functional programming uh, and compiling it to JavaScript. Okay, so that's what that is, because I think I, I've saw, seen one of Boda's talks before, uh, and I think she used TypeScript in that one. So this is, I think this, this is something probably related but new. So I, I'm interested yeah. in that as well. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's, it's Haskell-like. Where the 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 one really big difference is that it's strict and not lazy. Got it. Okay. <laughs> cool. So, uh, but dbuild. Dbuild. All right. Josh, take it away because you're the dbuild guy. Okay. Do it, man. So yeah, we, we open sourced our uh, the thing we use to do regression testing on the compiler. It's actually more of an integration test like build kit. So it's like a meta build, if you will. Like it builds other builds. Um, and the basic the basic idea behind dbuild is that everybody lies when they declare dependencies. Um, <laughs> that is, you declare you depend on like 1.0 snapshots, 
but that snapshot isn't like a thing. Like it's that's whoever recently published a snapshot, that's the one I want. It doesn't it's not necessarily useful. So what dbuild tries to do is you give it a bunch of source repositories and it tries to figure out the actual source level dependencies. Then it constructs a, a hash of all these dependencies and you get a unique ID for the thing you're building. And then it deals with dependencies on these unique IDs where we try to reconstruct what your actual source graph is. Okay, mm. That's the, the notion behind the tool. What it's really useful for is you can build the Scala compiler and a huge swath of the ecosystem all against that most recently built Scala compiler and see if you broke something. And run all the tests. Does any other does any other language or any other language community have something like this? Um, Not to my knowledge. Like the Haskell community, when they want to work on features, they will write scripts and things that go out and build a bunch of Haskell projects. Um, the the dbuild is mostly a workaround for just weird design in Maven and Ivy. Um, for how you deal, how you depend on things, right? And we're trying to restore source dependencies from binary dependencies. Um, Wait, what? So, okay, so it's like sort of Akka. turning the clock back, if you will. Yeah, so Akka declares binary dependencies on jars of Scala, okay, via Maven repositories. That's what its build is set up to do. That's oh, what Maven oh, is supposed to do. If, if so, you need to recompile everything from source, you need to. Um, you need you need to, to find the source corresponding to that jar. Exactly. Whereas, like, if you're using, you know, uh, if you're in the C ecosystem, generally, you know the sources that you're coming from. Like, if you're in a package manager or something. So, we're, you know, dbuild is essentially two parts. The first part figures out what all the dependencies are. The second part rewires your build and runs it um, to to be equivalent to the source dependency. So, uh, yeah. The, the languages which have the same problem as the JVM ecosystem where we push things as binaries and only binaries and not as source would need something like this. Like with JavaScript, you could, uh, if you wanted to like write a JavaScript compiler, you can just use Node and grab all of the sources of all the libraries you want or, or NPM or whatever the heck their package manager is. <laughs> <You're the laughs> source. So let's not get started on that one. <laughs> yeah. Well, anyway, because because it's a source based language. NPM, Bower, NPM. Yeah, NPM or Bower, whatever the hell you want. Um, you you could you could essentially grab all the source and do that same kind of thing. Um, I'm not exactly I'm not familiar with how Hackage is built. I know Nix is pretty awesome, and Nix kind of works the same. This. The, Nix has all of the principles that like are ride behind dbuild, but have none of the problems of Ivy or Maven that it has to work around. So Nix is is by far more pure and more awesome. But it's uh it's the same idea of you declare dependencies right, and you create cryptographic hashes of a project to its dependency, and then you can cache this thing and never rebuild it. Um, so if I'm doing integration tests across like five projects and I make a new commit into a f one, this one downstream, I only have to rebuild this one because the rest of them didn't change. But I need to track those dependencies all the way through. Um, and using dash snapshot is kind of a, a not a great way to do it because you can't roll back in history and see what happened. Like, what happened in this old build? What were the, all the snapshots in place at that point in time? Um, Maven has this notion of a unique revision now, which sort of helps you get back to that, but it's, um, anyway, a lot of, a lot of what I've seen in Maven tooling is, wor is working backwards to solve a problem that it caused, which is generally the case with all tools. Um, I'm good at that with SBT, right? But anyway, um, yeah, so, so dbuild is, is specifically to get back to this source dependency thing, and we use it for Scala to build, man, um, I, it's like 1.2 million lines of code of Scala mm. across 45 projects. That's our regression test suite right now. Was there any special reason that it wasn't open source before? Uh, basically, it, we weren't ready to have anyone else work in the code base because we were still changing things and redoing the architecture. I mean, if you open source something, you want it so the community can contribute, which means if you're actively doing massive redesign and you don't have the bandwidth to pull in the community and make them a part of that, you kind of want to give them something 
after yeah, that, people, right? Yeah, people people overlook that point, right? Um, where it's it's like you 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 want people to look at your project and you want people to want to get involved in it. Um, you know, everybody kind of has this initial sort of novelty novelty thing that's going to get them over the hump of like, well, I'm going to dive into this source code just a little bit and see what it's all about. And then there's a certain subset of those people who are going to want to contribute, right, and who are going to want to push it forward. Um, you only get one chance to appeal to those people via novelty. Yes, that's it, exactly. One chance. And, you know, you want, to, you want, you want that to stick. And, you know, I, I think... I think people can level criticisms about like, well, you know, you should just put it in the the community and like do the development in the open and whatnot, and you know, let let things fall where they lay. But the the truth is that that's just a recipe for open source abandonware, uh, or or if not abandonware, just like abandonware by everyone other than the company that's pushing it forward. Yeah, I think it's the, the, like, fix it and get it out there and build a community around it. When the tip, the typical story when something is still sort of in development like that is. People get interested. They do a bunch of the, uh, you know, that uh, they do a bunch of con contributions. Meanwhile, there's massive changes happening, and then all of their pull requests get either ignored or denied just because they won't merge in anymore, and that just creates bad feeling. And then they clear off and decide, ah, that that was a waste of time. I'm not going to do that again. So yeah, I, I think that's kind of that's that's what you want to avoid, and it sounds like that's what you were trying to avoid, Josh. Yeah, we we want it so that when people come in with ideas that may may even disagree with what we thought dbuild would be, but are good, that they can do that, right? And yeah. We were in the middle of a massive refactoring, so if someone would come in and be like, "Well, there's problems here, and I see a way to fix them," but we're halfway through this refactoring of going this direction, and uh, yeah. Anyway, it's easier to start with, "Okay, here's what it is," and we have a blank slate now of where it could go. I have ex expectations of where it might go. Um, but we don't have any. We have we have some internal things that are driving dbuild development, but nothing that that would be a massive refactoring like we had, you know, right before the the release, where it was just a huge consolidation of things and opening, changing of APIs for certain features we needed. Um, the modularization of Scala actually was a six months of refactoring in dbuild. Um, it, 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 Dbuild is uh, it's it's a one man person project. Uh, just just during that time, um, but yeah, it was it was basically what, six what man. Is a, what is a man person? Man person, I don't <laughs> a know. One man person. What what pr project managers deal with like man months and man weeks and I don't know. <laughs> so it should be person weeks. But yeah, when you char when when you build, like if there's four people on the project, but it's like one man person's worth of work because both of them are fifty percent or all of them are twenty five percent or whatever, you say it was one. I, man. Shouldn't we be gender neutral in this enlightened age, and shouldn't it be like person person? <laughs> I'm thinking it's person thread Dude, actually. I grew if up. I, I grew up in the most racist like area of the whole country. The fact that I'm not like out like anyway, I've the fact that you're not lot. wearing a white hood is. <laughs> <laughs> it's it, that's oh, the, we went there. That's for like who I am compared to who I grew up with. Yeah, <laughs> I um, think I think we just need to we need to decide this term is a person thread. That's what it is. It's a person thread. It's a person thread. Yeah. So yeah. anyway, it was it's basically an effective one one person thread during that time, and it took a while to to adapt to Scala's modularization because we had a whole bunch of new things we had to do to cross wire dependencies because Scala actually has circular dependencies right now in its builds. Um, you have a listener question on dbuild. We do. I was going to mention that. Well done. Mike Seth. Elquist. Let's answer that one. It says, how do you see dbuild being adopted by the community and the corporate world besides obvious uses like compatibility checking of type level Scala? Um, I don't know if it's going to get adopted by the corporate world. Um, I think what I've seen it internally in TypeSafe where people have been interested are when they have modularized ecosystems like, uh, you know, ACA Play, uh, the SVT yeah. plugin, where I have a set of things that I want to build together, and I, I want to, like, reduce the pain of keeping all these projects up to date. So what I want to do is, uh, let's say I find a bug in this project. I want to just, like, go grab my ecosystem and build it and see see if I break things. Yeah. Um, Josh, I, I have think that actually... problem all the time. All I was going to say, 
I, I think this will actually get used. I, I, you know, as soon as you um, started describing dbuild, I hadn't thought about it in these terms before, but I was absolutely reminded of, of this is exactly the way the build system worked at Google. Uh, Google, you built everything from the ground up. Uh, it was, it was a, you know, basically it was all source. There were no, there were no binaries distributed. Everything was built from the source level upwards. Isn't there a, a Linux? Version. Isn't there a Linux distribution that works that way? Gen that's, two. That's Gen what, Gen two. Well, Gen, Gen two, but there's also Nix now. You should, and Nix is from 2004. You should look at Nix. Nix is, if, if I were to, if if I didn't have to deal with uh, existing IV repositories, I would have just used Nix. Hey Daniel, at strange, at, at strange Loop, did you go to Mark Hibbert's talk about dependency management? I didn't. I really wanted to, but there was uh, something me, me, that was exciting. Uh, me, me too. I'm. I'll watch the video. <laughs> okay, people, people watch the video. Too. Yeah, dependency management is annoying. By the way, it's it's a fun fun problem. But anyway, uh, yeah. So in terms of adoption, one thing that I th I see Dbuild being pushed in a direction is making releases of. Uh, a, a cohesive product that's composed of multiple Git repositories. Um, I think you might see features along those lines. I don't know exactly what those look like, but I know that there have been more than two projects asking for it. So, yeah, um, that's a uh, there's a potential that that hits. Um, in, the, in this new world of microservices, even like a, a, a cat program is is composed of like 27 Git repositories now, right? <laughs> yeah, it's true. It's true. That's why we should move to the dog meme because uh, you can only have one. <laughs> the um, dog command. <laughs> if you're a dog person, you tend to have like a dog or two dogs. But if you're a cat that, person, you you you, 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 you will go all the way to thirty <laughs> cats. I'm talking about Unix cats. I'm not talking about cat cats. Oh, sure. Oh, but I like the idea of a Unix dog command. Now now that I think of it, it's actually been quite unfair to the dog-loving population that Unix has had a cat command but not a dog command for so long. I'm going to set out to write a dog command. I'm, I'm, typing, I'm typing brew install dog right now just to see what happens. <laughs> no. Speaking of which, hold on, hold on, hold on. Okay, so dbuild, what does the D stand for? Dog. Initially, it stood for distributed, as in you have more than one source repository that are distributed, and you need to build them together. But everyone was like, this doesn't run on a cluster, so it's not distributed. And I was like, but it is distributed. You're just not thinking of distributed right. And that never You're not thinking it. fourth dimensionally, Marty. Yeah. So then before we open sourced it for real, they're like, okay, let's think about the name and we had been calling it dbuild for so long that uh, a lot of people were locked in on that. So to torture the renaming committee, I was like, well, if we're going to keep calling it dbuild, let's just call it doggy build. Exactly. I like it. And, much uh, build. Many repository. <laughs> wow. It's, <laughs> it's, it's pretty good. And now, um, anyway, the, yeah, the D, the D originally was for distributed version control, essentially. So you have multiple version controls. You can think of it as like having multiple domains that you unify. I don't know. Or you can just call it dbuild and be done. All right. Cool. I think we exhausted that one. I think we did. Should we talk about serialization? We're at the hour mark. Yes. So serialization. Okay. I'm strong so, feelings about serialization. I wanted to have I wanted to have a discussion because. Um, like so, SBT right now is having this thread about serialization that uh, I think people have been sort of watching. Some people, maybe. Not a ton. I know that Paul Phillips was watching it and commenting. But there's this interesting... Uh, it's an interesting discussion. And we did a survey of the possible ways of serializing objects, both over the network, to disk, you know, over the wire. There, there are like 40 different projects to do serialization in Scala right now. There's no true winner... Um, I I agree that there's no true winner. I will say that now you know now that I think about it, in the past two years, pretty much all of my serialization and deserialization has been to and from JSON using Spray, and that's that. You know now now that I think about it, I'm like, damn, that's that's all I've done, pretty much. So not the so most it, efficient on the wire format, but very well supported by tools. 
If I were going to ask you what to use, you would probably recommend spray JSON or not. I so that's, do. That's well, I do like spray JSON. I like that. I like the type class approach. Um, I it's it, that's the one I'm familiar with, so it's the one I reach for first. Uh, and JSON is just. I mean, it's supported by everything, mostly because you know I'm usually chucking things in and out of um, you know CouchDB or um, I don't know other other databases where JSON is is first class support and uh, yeah now I think about it that's pretty much what I've done it's horrible for the you know the the, the uh, efficiency of the signal but that hasn't been a problem for ages I suppose so, BSON is the is the alternative there if you want something a bit more tight no my, my complaint with with like JSON is a convenient format because it lacks a lot of the negatives of other formats but it doesn't mark all of them, right? Uh, but no. the, the thing that I've run into is uh, we have we we had this GitHub automation where, like on Scala, it'll automatically tag pull requests and things, and it 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 was using the the GitHub API, and anytime they made minor semantic changes, the 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 JSON would just alter slightly, and then our stuff was broken. Uh. And that that there was a while where that happened really frequently. So you yeah, so not you're, been the case recently. But. So what what's missing there? You think is some sort of schema like XML with a version number on it and that kind of thing? Yeah, we so, need so we need the JSON version of XSD. There oh is yeah, a JSON, JSON version. Sorry. There is a JSON version of XSD. I think there's many competing <laughs> versions oh, of JSON XSD. There's so also Rich Hickey's new thing called Transit. I don't know if you've seen Transit. Yeah. But um, he he yeah it's it's a he can send JSON objects more efficiently than the raw JSON format to the browser. Like he can deserialize his format more efficiently than JSON itself. Maybe even we should he's skip, sending just JSON. Maybe but, we should skip the intermediate parts and just shoot straight for a full Corba implementation using JSON on the wall. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, we can't be friends anymore. anymore. <laughs> well, so the, there's also like I don't know if you guys are familiar with like Avro and Cryo. Cryo is but like Avro. For, for Avro. No, Avro my, my, my boss is the guy who works Google on protocol project. buffers. That sort I was going to say that's Proto buffs. Proto buffs. I gotta say, Proto buffs have always concerned me in the fact that you have to ha you have to um, <laughs> fix a, fix an index position for these things, and I'm like, that just seems so. Arbitrary. It's it's yeah. it, it actually has a it has it has a purpose, and that is evolution of the API, right? I want to add a new field to a protocol buffer, and I don't want to have to redeploy my entire server cluster. Understood. So my protocol isn't really that. changing, but I'm adding this new field where if it's there, I'll use it, kind of a so, thing, opportunistically. And it's dynamically typed, yes, but you, we're talking about over-the-wire serialization, so it's all bytes anyway. Um, but you want to add this thing and, and like be able to communicate, so you throw it on there with a new number, and then that thing goes away, and you want to be able to like send messages. You actually like that number remains forever as yeah. an unused thing. In fact, inside <laughs> inside of Google. <laughs> You would see the protocol buffer messages with a whole bunch of commented out ones, so that you oh, knew yeah. which numbers you couldn't reuse. So, so all right, that's awful. I'm sorry, but yeah. that's terrible. <laughs> I know exactly why it's there, but that yeah. is awful, and someone needs to say it because it's really, I, really I'm with you. Really bad. I'm with you, Daniel. So, yeah. so here's here's the thing. What we're talking about, like JSON, is we're we're using REST and JSON to dynamically type our APIs and just sort of like adapt to whatever the hell's there. We like I, I really want the ability to do two things with with serialization. So for SBT, I want to be able to define a protocol that's extendable. I want to have a protocol that people can communicate with, and semantically, I won't change this protocol. If you can communicate with these messages. Right, you get it. I want it. I want to have that be documented. I want you to know what that is. I want to know where the extension points are. I want that to be documented. Then I also need the ability to negotiate different protocols. So you communicate on protocol one, and here's how we send things over the wire to you. And then 
you can move to a whole new protocol too. Here's the API that you use, and we can communicate over the wire. But these are like types. These are like packages. These are interface jars almost. But I don't want it to be completely rigid like SOAP is. So have you seen have you seen my gist of how you do versioned protocols with rolling upgrade using S codec? No. Okay. <laughs> You're, and, not, you're, hold you're on. Just. Can I send? Can I send my, S code to the browser just, and DC it? Currently, that's such, a, that's such a casual way of putting something yeah. so so important out. Yeah. Well, it should probably be like it's actually in like the, the it's actually in specs two specification form, and I just like just did the whole spec. Um, I should probably like put it in. I don't. I should like put it in the the S code repo as like a case study or something, but. Um, it, it, I'm not sure that it would be suitable for, for Josh's purpose, but there's some ideas in there that I think he would like. Um, specifically, the whole thing is very strongly typed. I, I, like, I don't buy the whole bits on a wire excuse. It's very strongly typed. Um, it's ridiculously fast, and the versioning is strongly typed. So if you have, if you have messages that have evolved between versions, and I, can, I show multiple different types of evolutions in there, um, the compiler will actually catch you and will not allow you to to compile without providing a deserialization for a particular version, even if that deserialization is the same as another version. So um, I also have some examples right of now. how you can do. What was that? I'm looking at it right now. It's called specs or s codec dot scala. That's a clever name. Yeah, I, I well, okay. So I have I have this Alfred workflow that posts post gist, and I have to give file names, and I'm like in the heat of the moment, so I just like blah dot scala. And what is what is the unit monad mo used for? It's probably my favorite monad now that I know oh, it exists. Oh, good God. It's actually a monoid. It's not a monad. Oh, sorry. Um, what is the is, unit monoid used this, for? This was, so this was a problem. Well, problem. So unit has a monoid. OK, so for those listening at home and who don't have blackboards handy, a monoid simply represents uh, a pair of functions, right? You need a, a, a unit function, ironically. Um, which is just unit uh, zero, is zero, right? Yeah. Unit a zero, a zero or starting value or initial yeah. value or whatever. Uh, yeah. An initial value, and you need an append function. Yeah. And or unit, uh, the, the, the zero and the append have to be related such that when you append zero, you get whatever it was you were appending to. So, um, can we so make unit, a unit actually has a monoid. It's why just don't you, trivial. Why didn't you use the null, mon null monoid? Because you already have a, a tag that says, heaven forgive me. So you could put whatever you want <laughs> after that comment. So you don't the, have the to use unit. You can use null. So the problem is that S codec in a prior version, which I wrote this again, um, okay. some of its commenters required a monoid for the type you were dealing with. Yeah. And the type I was dealing with in this particular case was unit. So I had to give a monoid for it. Now, that's OK. <laughs> Because unit has a monoid. It's just like the weirdest thing you will ever see in code. They have now fixed that. It's it's done. Like that's that's been resolved. But basically what S codec does is you, you work at a fundamental level in terms of these primitive this primitive called a codec. And it, it a codec is simply a function that maps from bytes to A and from A back to bytes. Yeah. And it's it's partial, so you have ethers in there. But you get the idea, right? And it has commenters right. that allows you to compose these things such that the composition always preserves that bidirectional property. So you can build up you can build up very, very compact, very fast binary protocols using these these type safe composable interface. Um, I would not recommend this for sending data to a browser, but the idea in here that I want you to see is the version partial the, the version function, right? No, I, I see that. That's actually that's actually quite clever. So instead of basically you add a level of abstraction where you you instead of defining a implicit formatter for how do you take something and turn it into bytes, you define a function which takes a version and then gives you a formatter. Yep, and you can make that implicit if you want to, and you can make all of this machinery magical. But it's yeah. I think it's better to be explicit about it. And so then, when you want to serialize things, you pass in the the version right yep. there, then and yeah. there. Yeah. And there's, so, there's there's two cool things you can do with this. Number one. You can make that version function, as I did, a partial function, in which case the compiler tells you if you forgot to specify a version for something. Or number two, you could make it a shapeless poly function, and that shifts the burden to the call site, and the call site would have to say, oh, I have different logic for different versions, and the compiler would verify that the call site is handling that correctly. Go ahead, Josh. Oh, I was going to say, does this does this handle open extension of the protocol? 
So, like, uh, specifically for SBT, this is a problem that we have, which, again, we could be inventing. But we have a protocol layer for core SBT, but we also have plugins. And we want to allow plugins to communicate either, like, to disk and back to themselves or over the network to the UI, right, whoever's connected to you, either it's the terminal or IDE or whatever. Okay, so there's this ex protocol extension bit where you have a, pr a, a protocol that, that encodes within it a sub-protocol for the UI that you need to serialize things in and out. So you could do that with S codec, and I, I give I give some commentators that makes that that make that possible. They're now in S codec's core repository. Um, like the, the some of the backtracking commentators give you the ability to like test stuff and then back out and like you know work off of conditionals within the stream. But um, I don't I don't demonstrate that use case in my in my gist really. Okay. So you, could, you could probably do what you're talking about, but you, you would need to use some of my some of my backtracking commentator stuff. Yeah, just just curious because that's that's like now the question is is this how you should be thinking about serializing things over the network? Like, should you be thinking of I have this protocol, I'm going to lock it down, document it in one spot, write all these things to serialize in and out. Then, oh, I need something new. I redo the protocol, create protocol two, change my serializers so I know how to serialize version one and version two. You know, I go. Is that is this the right way to deal with network serialization? Like, pro, you know, to think of it that way. Well, you notice that my code actually serializes version one into version two things. It's just a little confusing to read it because all the versions are coexisting mm -hmm. simultaneously. But like, the I tried to comment it to make sense, but like. Yeah, it's like some of if you see the partial functions that don't have cases for every version, that represents a state of the application before those later versions existed. So when you see multiple versions, that actually means this is a state of the application where version four existed, but I still have clients out there talking in terms of version one. But I don't want to have like seven different versions of my ADT internally. I just want to serialize to point, right? So I write a codec that serializes point in all of those different protocols and has default values or conversions as necessary. Hmm. I'll have to look so, into it more, man. But yeah, I, 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 you know, Josh, when you proposed this topic, I said, I said, oh, you know, okay, yeah, but it's a depressing topic. I, I want to. <laughs> I mean, it, it is, isn't it? Like, is, is this why we? Is this what we enjoy about programming? Is like. Yeah, you know, bits on a wire. It's uh, the all the different ways you're doing it, and then even once you've picked a way that there's that there are all these there's all these versions within that way that you've picked, and ah, uh, it's um, so, well, it, it, it just uh, it makes me want to just curl up and. You know what it reminds <laughs> me of though? It, it feels like dealing with binary compatible APIs and bytecode, right? I mean, it's it's very so you're you're sending you have bytes, and you need to you need to figure out what they mean. Yeah, I want some. I want some in brilliant person to have some deep insight into why this, how this problem can sort of be avoided before it even starts. <laughs> well, oh. you know, like if, if if somehow every you know like so we have we have values in memory and then we have bytes on the wire and it's like can we can we somehow prevent that just that difference from even arising? Well, this is like this is like a fundamental, a uh, fundamental thing with like applications in different state, right? You can think of it in terms of people too, right? So I have my brain state that I want to transfer to you, Seth, right now, but your your brain is in a different, you know, prerequisite state than my brain is. So I have to find the metaphors to encode my brain state in such a way that you can decode it and sort of arrive at the same thought process, right? I mean, we call this language. Um, this is a very hard problem for people too, um, but it's you know a, you know with computers I think it's it's more kind of in your face because you actually have to be precise about it. I would like to talk about this at great length one day. I'm hoping that at some point that will become possible. <laughs> this, is, this is something that I've actually done a fair amount of work in in the last couple of years and uh, it's all been under contract and we're trying to figure out ways of getting some of that out there into the the bigger wider world right now so uh, but yeah I think uh, sort of what Seth's aiming towards is something that we sort of hit on glancingly while we were doing this stuff and it, it, it is quite interesting so yeah. 
So somebody commented in the question, uh, Stephen Gangstead says, uh, <laughs> yeah. is such a thing as JSON-X, which is representing JSON as XML? Um, oh, that's, damn. That's what makes I me sad. I feel dirty just for reading that. So that's what, That makes me sad. You have the JSON, and then you have the sharp edges that you can cut yourself on. Exactly. Well, the angle bracket. Cool is, oh, you, my you, eyes! Can you make an XSD for JSON XML? <laughs> so here's here's actually something that's interest, an interesting property of these two formats. You can take any JSON document and represent it in, in XML, and it's actually kind of trivial to do that. You cannot take any XML document and represent it in JSON. XML oh, sure is you, a strictly more expressive language. Sure you can. What you can do is take the XML, stick it in a string, and put it into ah. JSON. Done. Yeah. Okay. That... I guess... And I was about to say you can do the same thing from JSON just by sticking no. it in C data. Related, related. Have you guys seen, have you guys seen Transit from Rich Hickey? <laughs> yes. I was just looking at that in the link, actually. Yeah. I was sort of reading up on it in the background here. It's, 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 it's definitely an improvement over JSON. Like, if you have to use JSON because you're going to send crap to a browser and pull it in as a JavaScript object and then manipulate it, it's better than JSON. Right, it's better. It's it's more efficient. It it has some really cool tricks and compressions that are optional and interesting ideas. Um, but I think it, it still suffers. It, I th this whole notion of protocol and versioning and like understanding what your interface is from this guy to that guy. If you want to have some sort of type system around that and some sort of like here is what we support and how we support it and I'm going to maintain this. If you want to do that. That like, that's completely not solved by transit. You can still use yeah. transit, but that's the thing I want. That's that's the piece I really need. This 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 uh, gist that you have, I'm still mechanically doing all of that work. Protocol buffers, you know, call it what you will. They tried to give you types to represent. Here's my specification of our communication and here's what this message means and what it does and it's 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 thinking about it from the protocol side. You can still use transit as your transport layer. You could still use like, you know, uh, you could still have something generate picklers and and, and, and and all that kind of stuff from that. But there's there's a you lose flexibility on one side or the other depending on what you do or, or safety or you know description. Like the the I get really frustrated using REST APIs that have terrible documentation all the time, and you hack with what you see in the REST API and get something working, and then it breaks shortly thereafter, right? All the time. Yeah. And then now that I'm maintaining a project that has an API, I get frustrated with not being able to, like, prevent, you know, prevent, prevent myself from breaking clients, essentially. Yeah. I want to make sure that I don't break existing clients that are out there that are using my stuff. Or if I do, I do so knowingly, and I have some sort of hook to tell them, upgrade. You know, this this version no longer supports that version. So, I don't know. That that ecosystem does frustrate me, and I was curious what you guys use, or if, if we just sort of... I think most places I've been, we sort of, you sort of throw your hands in the air and just go dynamic. <laughs> Yeah, I, I write all my pickling in Ruby. Which I then compile to Haskell and then yeah. and then run that in Scala. Exactly. I, I have a Haskell DSL that, that encodes Ruby in the language. It's pretty pretty <laughs> exciting. We have a question that says the goggles do nothing, but I I feel like this is there is no spoon, like what what is what is being conveyed with this message? Something I'm not really metaphysical. Sure. Um, he does have goggles on in his uh, icon. Maybe that's what he's referring to. The the parrot is real. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the goggles mm. do nothing. It's very deep, I think. Yeah. Definitely. I, I'll, I'll ponder that and see if I can come up with a really good philosophical answer to the goggles do nothing for the next Scalawags. I'll, I'll take that on as a as a background task. I think I think we should do that. In any case, I think we're done ranting about serialization. There's a bajillion <laughs> frameworks out there. They all do different things. Yeah. Um, 
if you want to take case classes and dump them to disk, there are lots of elegant ways to do that. If you want to maintain protocols, there there are other ways to do that, and they're competing. Apparently, Daniel has a gist that we should all read. <laughs> ah, there's, oh there's, more, there's more context now, which is uh, the goggles do nothing regarding the JSON as XML. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, th sorry, the goggles do nothing to prevent how sad we are about JSON as XML. Got it, yeah. got it. Yeah. Nice. I don't know, I'm never going to forget that now. In fact, <laughs> in fact, we should make a Corba specification for how you send JSON. As using, XML. Using XML, yep. Yeah, can we, uh, Corba services. I like it. I'll bring back Corba, I say. <laughs> uh, oh, here's a question from Mike Bilquist. Or Mike Bilquist. Do we have thoughts on the Go compiler targeting the JVM that's written in Scala? Doesn't so doesn't Go on the JVM defeat the point of Go? Well, the interesting thing is if their compiler is written in Scala, that's what. <laughs> well, Scala is actually an excellent language to write a compiler in, but. So, why we're, the JVM? My selection for the JVM for the target of my compiler does not reflect any thesis about the performance of the platform. Rather, it was motivated by two reasons. One, compatibility. There's a lot of excellent libraries are written for the JVM. Jago hopes to make use, make existing Go users more productive by enabling them to use these. Furthermore, many groups have large code bases written in Java, Scala, and other JVM ecosystems. Jago is an attempt to bring these groups into the fold and expose them to Go. Two, there is no need for yet another Go implementation targeting native code. So this is not necessarily the Go team itself. This is Harrison Clapperman uh, working on a Go compiler for the JVM. My thoughts on Go are unfortunately like immediately stoppered by the fact that they made if a statement and not an expression. And uh. after that, I was like, why? Have, have we learned nothing in the last 20 years? It's just mind-blowing to me. Go, go is a whole collection. Is there a ternary operator? Nope, there is no ternary. Or oh, there wasn't when I last looked, anyway. Well, Maybe there is now. Go, 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 go is like half, half good ideas. Like, good ideas. Good ideas. And yeah, so half, half of Go is good ideas, and the other half is ignoring 30 years of programming language. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> I'm surprised to learn that the like this Venn diagram of Go people and Scala people has even one person in the in the <laughs> intersection. Yeah. Uh, to be uh, to be fair, there's there, there's some like there's some things that that I like about Go. One is it compiles natively. Yeah. I I do miss that. I was working well, on Haskell the C project compiles natively though. And I was like, holy crap. That, yes, Haskell does compile natively, and um, yeah. Yeah, there is still I, no ternary operator in Go. I just looked it up. You have to use you have to use variables. You have no option. Nice. It's just like my goodness. It's. Well, uh, and uh, you know, Paul Phillips said it. He look, said it, it. It's an interesting language. If only they hadn't thrown out thirty years of learning. Yeah. yeah. It's all good. It's all good. You know what the coolest <laughs> language coming out of Google ever was? Go. The coolest no. language. Which one? Uh, it wasn't Dart. But it wasn't. It wasn't Dart. It's not Dart. In fact, there was a quote my one friend said where you know you never hear anything awesome about Dart. Like, when you talk to people at Dart, it's not like, oh, man, this is a great language. You kind of hear, like, oh, yeah, there's this Dart thing. Yeah. Which is kind of interesting. Anyway, no, the language that's the most exciting is the generic configuration language, otherwise known as GCL. Internally, they call it the Borg configuration language. Oh, right. Called BCL. That was the coolest language that came out of Google. The closest thing externally that you can see to it is uh, Nix, their, their language, or... TypeSafe config is sort of there, but missing a whole bunch of features that it would need. Um, but GCL was pretty much the best language internal to Google, in my opinion, that you could use on a daily basis. 
Michael is pointing out on IRC that, that we, we should retroactively slot uh, Jago into the uh, esoteric ecosystem segment. Uh, yeah, Jago actually does sound like a really awesome it's esoteric. It's fairly esoteric, like, yeah. Man, I mean, but if you're going to write a, a, a random language for the JVM, it should involve cats or dogs. Just, you know. Hey, Daniel, well, where's, your, where's your cat? Yeah, he's he's like on my lap right now. Oh, okay. All right. Well, Daniel Daniel's actually working on the My Little Pony language. Yes. So, um, yes. Yeah. In in collaboration with Boodle Industries. <laughs> looking 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 forward to seeing what that one has. Lots of love and friendship. I hear when there's the compiler error, its eyes get really big. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Anyway, oh, yeah. and now that, that that's stuck in my head. That image, that image is stuck in my head now. It's horrible. <laughs> when I'm when I'm compiling Scala tomorrow and I say Scala compiler errors, I'm going to think of a pony with really really big eyes, <laughs> like crying. Why yeah. did you use the wrong type? Yeah. A, a, a little, <laughs> I have a little to do teardrop. this again now. A little yeah. teardrop falling down. <laughs> Uh, oh no! Anyway, I, I think that might be the the closing image that we leave our listeners with. I think yeah. I think I broke our podcast. It's gone. Yeah, so, it's destroyed. Yeah. If if you were to if you were to quantify scalawags in terms of ponies, there there would be tears involved somewhere. <laughs> so, oh dear. In any case, all right. When it, <laughs> so anyone I, I wanna, who's listening on audio. The timeline. Anyone who's okay. listening on audio should understand that Daniel actually does have a cat on his lap. Yeah, that, yes. I guess that would be very confusing. Uh, 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 this isn't just a, a conceit. <laughs> yeah, and usually, usually before we go live, um, one of the cats and or dogs of the other members shows up somewhere. Generally, yeah. So it's, it's just my point. turn. <laughs> there was there was actually a, a good moment. I, I don't know if it will come out on the big. Uh, on the big video picture, but there was a great bit uh, earlier on where Daniel's cat turned kind of, you know, had its full head pointed towards the camera, and it had kind of the demon eyes going because of the light reflecting, and it was truly awesome and somewhat terrifying at the same time. <laughs> yes, Daniel has become a demonic cat. <laughs> not, not unlike not unlike Scala itself. Yes. <laughs> It's true. So, uh, just to, to follow up uh, on uh, on this podcast, if you guys, uh, you know, want to discuss anything, we do have a mailing list, which is not very active. And I think the mail that we had in the past, between last episode and this one, said, I see there's not a lot of, act of activity here, <laughs> but I wanted to... So please, please, you know, like, like, uh, comment. We have suggestions for people to interview, which we're gonna follow up on and bring, try to bring them on. So if you have suggestions, please make them. Uh, if you, uh, yeah, we, we join the mailing list, discuss things with us. We love talking, as you can tell, after an hour and a half. <laughs> and uh, yeah, thanks for listening. All right, so that's it, I guess.